Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Tom Brady has officially announced he is retiring after 22 seasons in the NFL. We have more on that coming up, but we're also following other top stories, including at least 7,000 people have been forced to evacuate following a massive fire at a fertilizer plant in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The fire chief says more water is being routed to the scene, and they are keeping the area cool in hopes of avoiding an explosion. Officials say there are three times more chemicals there than in the fertilizer plant fire in Texas that killed 15 people in 2013. And police have given the all clear after a new bomb threat at Howard University. This comes after multiple threats targeted at least six different historically black colleges and universities. Authorities found no explosive devices and have not discussed a potential motive, but school officials say it's clear they're being targeted for being historically black institutions. And the New York Times is buying the popular online game Wordle. Wordle has just had just 90 players in November. Now it has millions. The game will move to the New York Times website and will initially remain free, but the Times could charge customers in the future. And Pfizer is expected to seek emergency use authorization for its COVID vaccine for children as young as six months old. The application could come as soon as today. This as we see a decrease in cases and hospitalizations in the U.S. Mariah Villarreal has the latest. According to new reports, Pfizer is preparing to submit a request for its vaccine to be authorized for children as young as six months old. According to the Washington Post, Pfizer and its partner BioNTech are expected to submit their data as soon as today. Sources tell the paper for the first time in the pandemic, kids five and younger may be able to start receiving a two-dose course of the vaccine by the end of February. The steps towards vaccinating the youngest Americans comes amid a slowdown in the latest surge, with 38 states reporting a decrease in average daily COVID cases. An endemic doesn't necessarily mean that, that the virus is gone or that, or that it's necessarily safe. We may see more variants. We may see more surges. We are moving to a point where we can manage those things without disrupting our lives as much. And that's the mindset we have to get into. But in many places, like here along the South Texas border, doctors are still battling a surge of Omicron cases, with many expecting mothers coming in to deliver babies and testing positive. I would say 10 to 15 percent of the ones that are coming in have COVID. This mother choosing to quarantine away from her newborn after she tested positive while in labor. Nowadays, I feel patients are more informed. They say, OK, well, I know I have the virus and now I know I have to um, stay clean and isolate myself. The good news is that in this area, while they are still battling that Omicron surge, they have high vaccine rates here, especially among the elderly. As for those five states that are still reporting an increase, they are Idaho, Maine, Minnesota, Montana and Washington. Diane. All right, Maria, thank you. And I want to bring in Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital, ABC News Medical Contributor Dr. John Brownstein, for a little more on this. Dr. Brownstein, uh, thanks so much for being here. What do you think the timeline looks like after Pfizer applies for this emergency use authorization, and what impact could this have? Yeah, well, good morning, Diana. Great to be back with you again. Um, Likewise. Yeah, I think that... Um, we have a great opportunity to see the vaccine roll out now in those under fives. You know, there are so many parents that have been incredibly anxious. So we'll potentially see this, this authorization uh, application submitted and potentially by the end of February that uh, authorization for those two dose series. Now, we still don't know. There's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of the regulatory process. And we have to remember, they've expanded the trials to three dose. They started with two doses of that three micrograms, one tenth the adult dose, but that wasn't shown to produce a really significant immune response. So now we have these new trials. It's possible we'll see you know, authorization for the two dose and then potentially that third dose to get kids some level of immunity. Uh, we have to remember, there are millions of kids that have tested positive throughout this pandemic, so getting that protection is going to be super helpful. At the same time, we have to take the necessary steps to show this vaccine is safe and effective because we really haven't rolled out, even in the over fives, that well yet. So we have to really make the case for the vaccine and with the data, letting the data drive the decision right now. Is it possible that we end up getting feedback? Because there, it seems like the younger the age group, the more the debate starts stirring about boosters and vaccines and so on. So, so do you think there could be a debate over whether vaccines are necessary for this young age group? 
Absolutely, because, you know, as we know that, you know, the, the risk for kids, you know, as you go younger is lower. At the same time, kids do develop severe consequences of this, of this virus. But if the two doses is not producing the immune response that you would want to show real protection, there will be a debate. You know, is it worth getting my kids vaccinated now, not with no real significant data? So I think there's going to be a debate. On one hand, you have parents super anxious, wanting to get their kids vaccinated. On the other hand, you know, there are parents that really are not convinced yet. And we have not yet seen, you know, that sort of uptake in the 5 to 12-year-olds. That's only about 20 to 25 percent of kids in that group are fully vaccinated. It will continue to go lower as parents are more concerned about their younger kids. Now, 38 states are reporting a decrease in average daily COVID cases, finally. Uh, there is a lot of talk now about COVID turning into an endemic rather than a pandemic. So one, is that true? And two, can you explain what that really means? Yeah, no, I, I know this, you know, this endemic word is something that people keep talking about. It's really this idea that the virus becomes part of the respiratory mix of infections. You know, we have, you know, cold and flu season, we have other coronaviruses. This coronavirus will be part of that and we'll, you know, we'll deal with it and learn to live with it. But we have to remember, we have still yet vaccinated billions of people across the globe. We're still dealing with the surge, so we're not there yet. But I do think we have to head towards a place that we're learning to live with this virus. We have vaccines, therapies, testing, and I think ultimately we'll have better vaccines down the pike. But we also have to know how to off-ramp. I think that's going to be a real challenge. How do we start to remove masks? How do we start to gather indoors? I think we have to begin to off-ramp to that normal life because we may deal with the surge in the future and those restrictions will have to come back and people will have to be able to embrace them. So I think, you know, we're heading there, but, you know, obviously we're still dealing with substantial transmission in the community. So, you know, we're not quite to a point where I think, you know, we can call, you know, anywhere near uh, victory on this pandemic. All right, Dr. Brownstein, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with his Russian counterpart this morning about the tense situation on the Ukraine border, urging Russia to de-escalate the situation. It comes in the wake of a high-stakes showdown at the U.N. Security Council. Senior Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel is in Ukraine with the latest. A critical day for diplomacy amid ongoing tensions between America and Russia over Ukraine. Secretary of State Blinken speaking with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov today. The State Department saying the Kremlin's formally responded to America's security proposals, Russia denying that. U.S. and Russian diplomats clashing on Monday at the United Nations over the more than 100,000 Russian troops massing on the Ukrainian border, with the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, warning more troops could be on the way. We've seen evidence that Russia Russia intends to expand that presence to more than 30,000 troops near the Belarus-Ukraine border. The ambassador stressing the gravity of the situation. This is the largest, this is the largest, hear me clearly, mobilization of troops in Europe in decades. So the diplomatic stakes are now higher than ever. Russia denying it plans to invade and the Biden administration saying it doesn't believe Putin has yet made a firm decision. And on the front lines here, Ukrainian citizens on high alert. Engineers, journalists, parents volunteering with this military reserve unit taking up arms to defend their homeland. So you're training to fight for your country. Yes, uh, for my family, uh, for my city, uh, and of course uh, for my country. In the sign of how serious the Ukrainians are taking this crisis, the president signing a decree ordering the armed forces to increase by 100,000 and the head of the Defence Council saying that in the event of an invasion, the country could mobilise up to 2.5 million people. So while the diplomats still talk and try to achieve peace, there's every sign here that Ukrainians are preparing for war. All right, Ian Panel in Ukraine. Thanks, Ian. And now to that breaking news from NFL quarterback Tom Brady. After days of speculation, Brady is now officially announcing he is retiring from football after 22 seasons. Brady made that announcement in a post on social media, writing, I have loved my NFL career, and now it is time to focus my time and energy on other things that require my attention. And let's talk a little bit more about this with ABC News contributor LZ Granderson. LZ. Thanks so much for coming on. Why do you think he chose to post this now? I mean, the past few days have just been full of speculation. Even his dad came out against the rumors, and now here's Brady <laughs> saying, you know what? I am retiring. 
You know, that's a fantastic question. And I'm sure at some point he's going to relay the answer as to the timing of it all. Um, I would hate to think, and I know this is the antithesis of the industry that I'm in and that you're in, Diane, but I would hate to think the breaking news of him retiring days ago forced him to come out with a statement now before he was ahead, before he was ready to. Um, and the only reason why I would hate to think that is because if he wanted more time to contemplate and there was an opportunity through that deliberation to have yet one more season of Tom Brady, it looks like we've lost that opportunity. So that's the only reason why I'm saying that. But, you know, it's a beautiful post. Uh, we all know about his 22-year career, the two teams, the championships. The thing that I respect most about Tom Brady is that he's not leaving because he can't play. He's leaving because he wants to do something else. And that is a tremendous way for any athlete to leave, but definitely one who's in a conversation of being the greatest of all time. And, and you know, Robert Kraft just put out a statement on this singing his praise for Tom Brady and saying, among other, among other things, I have the greatest respect for Tom personally and always will. His humility coupled with his drive and ambition truly made him special. I will always feel a close bond to him and will always consider him an extension of my immediate family. It's interesting, though, LZ, Brady didn't mention the Patriots in his post. Did that surprise you? Not really. Um, you know, this is about Tom Brady. And while it is true that Tom was a Patriot for much of his career and most of his success came as a Patriot, the reality is, is that his move to Tampa Bay was about separating his own legacy from the Patriot way and in some ways separating himself from being seen as a Bill Belichick prodigy. And Bill Belichick is considered the greatest coach of all time. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that as he's discussing his own journey, he's staying focused in as much as possible as where he is right now and not where he once was. I don't think that's a slight necessarily. Um, perhaps we'll see it under more reporting as the days go by. But my initial response to that was he wants to talk about himself and where he is right now in life and not what he's accomplished and, and think about the past. But he did spend a lot of time talking to the Buccaneers and not anything there mentioning the Patriots. So I expect we're going to hear a little bit more about that conversation, as you said, as the day I goes think on. So. <laughs> um, so what do you think? You're, you're, you know, you're understandably saying this is about Tom and, and what's what he's done and what's next for Tom Brady. So what do you think is next for Tom Brady and what happens now with the Buccaneers? You know, those are two fascinating questions. You know, Tom Brady has spent most of the past two seasons not just trying to make the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a Super Bowl champion and thus separating his legacy from that of the franchise he, that drafted him, you know, 199, but he's also spent two years, in a lot of ways, sort of reintroducing himself to the public as a person. You know, remember, outside of the controversies, the various gates, whether it's the Flake Gate, Spy Gate, you know, Strawberry Gate, all the gates that he's had, <laughs> as well as obviously the MAGA hat and him being able to kind of avoid talking about why that MAGA hat was in his locker, particularly around the time of, you know, as we're looking at the insurrection and his connection to, to President Trump, he was able to duck all of those conversations and, 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 and questions but he has spent two years talking about The Man in the Arena, which is a show that he's streaming. Um, he's been a lot more open in terms of where he is via his podcast. And I think what was really telling was that he was willing to acknowledge the position he was in as it pertained to President Trump and the MAGA movement with his joking to, with um, President Biden when he visited the White House. Um, making the sort of the reference about a questioned result and, you know, whether or not there would be a recount. That was Tom Brady's attempt to try to distance himself from the MAGA controversy and also introduce himself as a personality. And so I don't see him coaching. I don't see him being some sort of court consultant for, for a GM position or a quarterback's coach, but I do see him being more involved in media. We know that Peyton Manning and his brother Eli Manning has made a successful transition over. Those were contemporaries of his, as well as Drew Brees has made that transition over into the media side. So I would not be surprised at all if you see Tom get more involved with media, either as a commentary or as someone who, has, who is sort of occupying his own space like Peyton is. So, LZ, seven Lombardi trophies, five Super Bowl MVPs. Does Brady leave as the greatest of all time? I think it all depends upon what your definition of GOAT is. Now, I'm under the belief that Aaron Rodgers is physically the most talented player to play the position. Um, 
you know, I'm under the belief that Lamar Jackson and Michael Vick are two of the most dynamic and exciting guys to ever play the position. But no one has come close to winning at the clip of Tom Brady. And so if your definition of greatest of all time is about wins and losses, then absolutely, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time and one of the greatest athletes of all time. And he, in my opinion, is the greatest team sport underdog story of all time. Venus and Serena Williams are still the overall underdog story, success story, but Tom Brady is right there and is number one when it comes to team success underdog stories for sure. All right, LZ Granderson, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Diane. And coming up, a federal judge has rejected a plea deal for two of the men convicted of killing Ahmad Arbery. Hear why the judge made the rare move after a quick break. Welcome back. A judge has rejected a plea deal in the federal hate crimes trial of Gregory and Travis McMichael, the father and son convicted of murdering Ahmad Arbery. The deal would have allowed them to serve a large part of their life sentences in federal prison instead of state prison. But Arbery's mother asked the judge to reject the deal, saying, quote, the state of Georgia already gave these men exactly what they deserve. Senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami has the latest. We want 100 percent justice. The family of Ahmaud Arbery is thanking a federal judge for listening. Judge Lisa Godby Wood is refusing a plea deal before next week's trial that would have kept Travis McMichael and his father Gregory out of a state prison and into a federal one for much of the life sentences they received at state trial in November. The two and their neighbor were all sentenced to a life in a state prison for murdering Ahmaud Arbery on a tree-lined street nearly two years ago. The rejected plea, which was agreed to by prosecutors, would have allowed the father and son to spend 30 years of their life sentence in a federal prison. I think that they wanted to go to a federal prison because they felt it would be safer, and those prisons tend to be a little bit nicer. I fought so hard to get these guys in, in state prison. Very disrespectful. It is rare for a federal judge to reject this kind of plea agreement. The Arbery family attorney says it's because the family spoke up. What the family was trying to impress upon the court was that the conditions of the confinement must remain in state prison where they have been sentenced to serve uh, the rest of their lives. If they change their plea back to not guilty, all three murderers will be prosecuted for allegedly targeting Ahmaud Arbery because of his race. Jury selection begins regardless on Monday. So far, William Roddy Bryant, the third man who was convicted of murder at the state trial, the neighbor who helped, he still faces federal trial on Monday. We'll find out by Friday if the other two men join him. Diane. All right, Steve Osinsami, thank you. And let's bring in Terry Austin, a host and legal analyst at the Law and Crime Network for more on this. Terry, good morning. What exactly would this plea deal have done and why is Arbery's family so opposed to it? Well, first of all, good morning and welcome back, Diane. Thank you. This plea deal, I think, was rejected by Judge Wood because, partly, the family did argue against it. And it is unusual for a judge to reject this type of plea because you have the defendants and you have the prosecution all saying this is fair and this will save time, it will save money. And frankly, 30 years in federal prison is a sentence that is something someone would view as just and fair. But I think the judge really looked at this as it was a heinous crime. It was a hate crime. She did listen to what Wanda Cooper Jones said. And at the end of the day, she just did not think 30 years in federal prison was enough. So what does this mean now for how this case moves forward? So they still have an opportunity to say that they are pleading either guilty or not guilty, and that the judge said they need to do by Friday so they could go to trial. And if they go to trial, it is a big risk for both sides, frankly. And one of the good things about a plea deal, if the judge had accepted it, is that the verdict cannot be appealed. So if they go to trial, they could win or lose, and that verdict could be appealed. So. The next thing we'll see is whether or not they're going to plead guilty, and then we'll see what happens. And meanwhile, jury selection is now underway in the trial stemming from the police raid that killed Breonna Taylor. But the trial isn't actually focused on Breonna Taylor's death. So can you walk us through what this trial is all about? 
Well, Brent Hankinson, he is the police officer who is being tried here. And it's not for shooting and killing Breonna Teller. It's for having shot into the neighbor's home and the fact that it was basically reckless for him to do so. And it's three counts of wanton endangerment, endangerment of others. And so he's going to trial. It seems like the other two officers and Hankinson will also be witnesses at the trial. All right, Terry Austin, thank you. Thank you. And coming up, we are celebrating the Lunar New Year, what it means to be born in the year of the tiger when we come back. Welcome back. We are celebrating the Lunar New Year today. So what does it mean to be born in the year of the tiger? Jacqueline Lee from our station WPVI in Philadelphia has a look at what this holiday represents. Good morning, America, and happy Lunar New Year. The Lunar New Year's festivities are upon us, ushering in the Year of the Tiger. This will be a year of risk-taking and adventure. So what is Lunar New Year? Often called Chinese New Year, it's a holiday celebrated across many Asian cultures, featuring decorations meant to bring luck and happiness in the year ahead. We need more red lanterns for good fortune and joy. It follows the lunar calendar, which begins on the second new moon following the winter solstice. Each year is assigned one of 12 animals from the Chinese zodiac. Those born in the year of the tiger are considered brave, competitive, and confident. Marilyn Monroe is a tiger. Lady Gaga is a tiger. Amanda Gorman is a tiger. And even the queen is born the year of the tiger. For those of us celebrating around the world, it's all about the traditions. My family always celebrates Lunar New Year by going to the Buddhist temple at midnight, praying and manifesting prosperity, love, health, and success. And of course, no New Year is complete without some delicious dining. My favorite things that my family serves is a steamed prosperity cupcake that my grandma makes every year. Wow! The taller it blooms and blossoms, the more good luck you'll have in the New Year. And dancing. What it symbolizes is really um, chasing away the evil spirits, so it's a way to bring prosperity and good luck into the upcoming year. And a Lunar New Year superstition, you don't want to clean your house today. It's seen as sweeping away the good luck. Diane. All right, Jacqueline Lee, thank you for letting us know we do not have to clean our house today. I'm Diane Macedo. Thank you all for joining us. ABC News Live continues with news, context, and analysis. And a happy Lunar New Year to you all. I think it would be irresponsible of me as we go through World Pride Month not to speak of the events at the Stonewall Inn in June of 1969. Well, I'm certainly not going to stand up here and pretend to be an expert on what happened at Stonewall. I do know what happened should not have happened. The actions taken by the NYPD were wrong, plain and simple. The actions and the laws were discriminatory and oppressive, and for that, I apologize. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.